the book is aimed at the, the so-called creationists who spend a lot of time discrediting Darwin and trying to dissuade schools from teaching evolution. Uh, you don't see hardly any of this in Canada. I mean, is this group even large enough to be bothered with? It is undoubtedly large enough to be worth bothering with in the United States, and that's a pretty important market. It's not negligible in Canada, I suspect. It's not negligible in Britain. Um, largely, I think, through ignorance. I think it's 28 or 27 percent of the British population think that humans coexisted with dinosaurs. That's getting and it wrong the percentage right. that you're saying, too, is, is not just people who say they believe there's a god that creates larger meaning, but you have, I think, 44 percent of Americans saying that man was created in his current image within the last 10,000 years. Which is an astonishingly erroneous idea. It's not just slightly wrong. No, and, you, and you call these people wrong. history deniers, and almost as if there's an analogy there to Holocaust deniers. Well, I make the, that comparison explicitly, and I gathered since that, that it's rather a sore point. I don't quite understand that. I mean, both of them are history deniers. Both of them deny the manifest facts of history. The evidence for the Holocaust is overwhelming. The evidence for evolution is overwhelming. Both happened in the past, so you can't actually see it happening before your very eyes. In the case of the Holocaust, we do, of course, have eyewitnesses. But eyewitness e evidence is not the most compelling evidence anyway. In the case of evolution, there's a certain amount of eyewitness evidence, but obviously, mm -hmm. and I've got a chapter on that called Before Your Very Eyes. But eyewitness evidence isn't the only kind of evidence. And I use the analogy of the detective coming on the scene of a crime after it's happened. So you, have, you can't actually have any eyewitness evidence. You can't see the, the uh, crime being committed. But the evidence that's been left lying around in the form of fingerprints and footprints and DNA samples and things like that is there. And that's what we have in the case of evolution. And it is totally overwhelming. It is at least as strong as the evidence for the Holocaust. Both are history deniers. Before we get into the, that evidence, because I know our viewers will find it fascinating in its own right, I mean, will you make a, a point that one of the problems of providing a proof of, uh, of evolution rests in the very notion of what is a theory? Yes. Explain that to me. Well, the word theory is rather a pernicious word because it has two rather different meanings. To a scientist, theory is something like the heliocentric theory of the solar system mm -hmm. or um, the theory of gravitation, right. which is not the same as the colloquial meaning of theory, which is sort of something more akin to hypothesis, something that is just a kind of guess and it might be true and it might be false and nobody's ever proved it. Hence the phrase... Um, Evolution is only a theory. Where's your evidence? You've never found the missing link, etc. Prove it. Um, it's not that kind of meaning of the word theory. I don't know if this is deliberately deceptive misuse of the word theory. Probably not. It probably just stems from ignorance. So, so for you, I mean, the, the theory of evolution is uh, basically an explanation supported by evidence. S yes. In all your work, what is the single most overwhelming piece of evidence for you? documenting uh, evolution. It's very hard to choose one because it's all so strong. Like the detective. It's the, finding that's all, right. the, all the pieces together. L like the detective. Um, I suppose one thing I would say is that fossil evidence is not the most compelling evidence. Fossil evidence is very compelling, mm -hmm. but it's not quite the most compelling evidence. I suspect the most compelling evidence would either be the evidence from geographical distribution. The detective finds that the distribution of animals and plants over the islands and continents of the world is exactly what you'd expect. Expand on that, because this is very interesting. The whole yeah. notion that the tectonic plates and continental drift provides fantastic evidence for evolution. Yes. Um, if you think about how the animals and plants should be distributed if God had put them there, there seems no obvious reason why God would have deliberately put animals and plants on islands and continents in such a way as to make it look as though they'd evolved. So Darwin, for example, looked at the Galapagos Islands mm -hmm. and noticed that the animals there are recognizably of a South American type. They're sort of pretty good affinity to South American animals, but they were different enough that you could name it, none of them were actually the same as South American animals. And moreover, even on the different islands within the archipelago, they were somewhat different. And everything fell into place when Darwin later realized that it could be explained if you assume that a rare individual or pregnant female or something of that sort of, a, a, a few individuals perhaps, drifted across from South America in a very rare event. I mean, the sort of thing that only happens once every million years or so. It's very rare. Um, and then once they got there, 
they then started to change and, and modify themselves. But they evolved quite uniquely because of the, the geographic isolation. That's right. And then if you look at the different islands within the archipelago, where the distance apart is a matter of tens of miles rather than hundreds of miles, they're much closer to each other. And so once again, you have rare drifting from one island to another, but not so rare because 20 miles is a, is a lot easier to drift across than 600 miles, which right. is the distance from South America. But, but there is a reason there are no platypuses in Canada. That's right, and, and that you, you, find only, you find them only in Australia. Only marsupials in Australia, basically. Uh, pretty much so, yeah. yes. Now, there were marsupials in South America, mostly extinct, but one, one or two remain, um, like yapoks and, and possums, um, and some of them even got into North America. Um, so the, the distribution of animals is precisely what you'd expect if, if a rare immigrant got in there at some early point. You stated that fossil evidence isn't the necessarily the most compelling, but certainly probably the most familiar to, uh, to, to our viewers. Explain how fossil evidence uh, works and why, again, the ordering of where fossils are found in different layers of the Earth's uh, crust tell us something about evolution. We are very, very lucky to have any fossils at all. Uh, it's a remarkably fortunate uh, ph phenomenon, fossilization. But most animals that die never fossilize. Most species that die never fossilize either. So we have to look at it as a sort of rare, privileged trace mm. of the evidence from the past. Now, there are, of course, gaps, because, as I say, most species, most animals don't fossilize. So there are huge gaps in some places, small gaps in, in others. You cannot expect the fossils to provide you with a kind of cinematic replay. Frame by frame, frame of by the frame. entire Most story. of the frames are missing. Right. It's like a, a film in which only one in a thousand of the frames of the film are still, are still there. However, what you can say is that not a single fossil has ever been found in the wrong place. Now, this is a very important point you make. Yes. Because not only is the fossil evidence kind of taken together, point to evolution as a, as a fact, but you say because of that, that is that evolution is calculatably falsifiable. Yes. That you could prove yes. evolution did not take place if you found something in the wrong... It would be so easy to disprove it if only you found something... You found a rabbit in, in the, the Precambrian, that, for Well, example. that was J.B.S. Haldane's famous, famous right. uh, example. And no such thing has ever been found. Um, there are one or two uh, fraudulent, obviously, cases, or not fraudulent, but, but mistaken ones. For example, in the Paluxy River, in Texas, there are dinosaur footprints, and they're genuine dinosaur footprints with, with, th with three toes. And there are also what look very, very vaguely, like just sort of one, one long footprint that they've interpreted as human footprints. I mean, they have to be a footprint of a giant, that's right. huge. But that's okay, because in Genesis it says there were giants in those days. Um, so for a long time... You're quoting Genesis now on me? G Genesis says there were, I'm, there were, there I'm were like, giants I'm in like, the, I'm those like days. So that's why they like it. But um, in, in, in fact, these are just dinosaur footprints without the, without the, the three toed, um, without the three toes. Um, and even the creationists have stopped saying these are, these are human footprints. Well, I want to talk about the creation, go back to them a little bit, because the, the, the existence of fossils are undeniable, and that they have found fossils that clearly show that, you know, that, that different species have taken different shapes in different periods of, of history. You, you talk in the book about uh, an explanation of the layering of fossils related to Noah's Ark. <laughs> that might be interesting well, for some. Um, it, it, it's, an, it's an observation that before a certain date, if you look at vertebrate fossils, you find mm. nothing but, but fish. And then a little right. bit later, you find nothing but a slightly more advanced kind of fish. And then a bit, bit later, you find amphibians. A bit later, you find reptiles. A bit later, you find mammals and so on. Um, and so there's, there, kind, there seems to be a kind of progressive layering as you go up the, up the fossil strata. And on the evolution idea, of course, it's obvious why that is. Um, there is a creationist theory that says, oh, well, in Noah's Ark, the, the cleverest and brightest and nimblest of animals headed for the hills when the waters were rising, and so they came to the top. And so um, mammals climbed higher up the hills when the waters were rising, and, and, and amphibians were lower, and reptiles... And in, that's in why the order that we find in, yeah, the, in yes. the fossilized records. Um, this is sometimes described as an ingenious idea. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, really. I mean, w one thing you could say about it is that on, on that theory, you would expect to find lots of exceptions. You, you might just about find a statistical tendency 
for the brightest and cleverest animals to be higher up the slopes of the hills. But you wouldn't expect to find that there's not a single exception. You wouldn't expect to find that not one single solitary mammal <laughs> drowned before it could get to that appropriate there level on the hill. There wasn't a stupid human or a stupid uh, mammal in the, yeah, uh, in, yeah. In, in the group. Now, the, it, 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 for as long as I've, I've, I've lived, I mean, the contrary uh, argument put forward to evolution is where is the missing link? Where is the Franke? Where are all these things that you know should be in transition between something that used to be and something that that uh, that we you know today? You make the point is that in fact there's tons of missing links out there. We've got a whole bunch of them. Yeah, tons of missing links and tons of missing links that have now been found. In particular, I mean the the, the word the phrase missing link is very often used specifically for human yes. ancestors. And at the time when Darwin wrote, there were no fo no human fo fossils. Uh, now there are lots, in Africa especially, because that's where the, human, the story of human ancestry was played out. There are now lots of fossils. Some of them are very beautiful. You can see them in museums in Africa and elsewhere in the world, often replicas elsewhere in the world. Um, now, Fronkies, that's, a, that's a, an, another order of stupidity, that particular phrase, that particular word. This is the idea that why is the, isn't there an intermediate between a frog and a monkey? Or the other mm -hmm. one is a crocodile. Why is no intermediate? Right. Um, that monkeys are not descended from frogs. I mean, monkeys and frogs are cousins. They're contemporaries of each other. You wouldn't expect to see a fronky anyway. You would expect to see, or, or a crocodile, you would expect to see intermediates between older fossils and younger fossils, and those we do see. We mm -hmm. see them in the human record. We see them in the horse record. We see them in the, in the whale record. We see them abundantly in um, mollusk and... and um, arthropod, the crustaceans and things like that, uh, records. We see plenty of intermediates between old fossils and young fossils. We see medium age fossils in between. That's what you expect to see. You do not expect to see intermediates between one modern animal and another. On the monkey front is that I think this also is affronts some of our kind of modern conceit about being a, being a human being. They, you know, we can't be evolved from monkeys. Uh, I mean, you make the point that our, our evolution is a little bit more diffuse than that direct, direct line. Talk, tell us a little bit about our family tree, our well, evolutionary um, family tree. If you go back uh, some 25 million years to see what our ancestor would have looked like then, it would have looked pretty much like a monkey. Mm -hmm. So we're not descended from modern monkeys. Mo modern monkeys and we are descended from older animals, which were much more like modern monkeys than they're like, they're like us, and so it would probably have been reasonable to call them monkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not descended from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are descended from the same common ancestor as we are, which lived about six million years ago. It would have looked more like a chimpanzee than like a human, but you wouldn't call that a chimpanzee by any means. It certainly wasn't a chimpanzee. Um, so I think it's it's a matter of how you use language. There are, there are some times when you say, well, the ancestor of fish and ourselves would surely have been called a fish. It would have looked like a fish and tasted like a fish. Uh, so it, it's reasonable to say we are descended from fish. But once again, we are not descended from modern fish. Modern fish and we are descended from ancient fish who are no more. The other thing I think that people have some problem with is that the time span is almost inconceivable when you talk about being evolved from a, a fish. But you, you mentioned you have a chapter here, kind of before our very eyes, that there's evidence of evolution, evolutionary change happening in species in a very short period of time all around the world. Talk to me about some of those examples. Okay, I mean, the, the biggest barrier to understanding probably is the, the sheer enormous length of time. Mm -hmm. and so it's valuable that we do have some examples before our very eyes. Inevitably, however, they have to be relatively small amounts of change because before our very eyes is a time scale of decades. And, and so we can't expect to have too much evolution going on in that time. Uh, nevertheless, what we have it is impressive. Uh, there are the, I quote an example of lizards on Mediterranean islands where experimenters about 35 years ago transported lizards from one Mediterranean island to another. This just is around left, Croatia, eh? Yeah, in, that's right. And just left them there. And then a, another group of researchers went back to the island 30-odd um, years later and found that the lizards had changed in an interesting way. They'd moved towards a more vegetarian diet. Mm -hmm. So on the original island, they were insectivores. And they moved on the new island to become more vegetarian, which influenced them in all sorts of ways. Their jaws became wider and stronger. The gut changed. 
they got they developed valves in the gut which are suitable for a vegetarian diet that they didn't have previously they didn't when they have, were insect eaters. Have, uh, previously so this isn't a matter of a few uh, 